you can turn to your pew Bibles, Galatians chapter 5, verses 16 to 25. Well, the Apostle Paul is teaching us about our spiritual life. But I say, he says, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Good things, right? You want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, we continue our sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. And we already managed to talk about seven elements of the fruit. We spoke about peace, joy, love, self-control, patience, uh, gentleness, and kindness. And there are two more elements of the fruit that we are going to talk about. So it's goodness. Today we are talking about goodness. And it's also faithfulness, faithfulness. I want to draw your attention to the fact that in our scripture reading in the Bible, it doesn't say fruits of the Spirit, it says the fruit of the Spirit. It's singular, uh, and it's more like a tangerine or an orange, when you have one fruit but several segments. So we have nine segments, nine elements, uh, but it's one fruit. The good thing is that this fruit uh, is given to us, this opportunity to grow this fruit is given to us as a gift. Every Christian has this gift. Now, the problem is that we do not actually experience it a lot, and we can talk a little bit about why. Why we don't see that divine patience or joy or kindness or self-control, right? So we'll talk about this a little bit later. But this is available to all of us, and it's a package. It's, a, it's, it's one fruit. Or as I uh, very often uh, say, it's like a bouquet of flowers. And each element is one beautiful flower. But we get the whole fruit, which is the whole bouquet. And, uh, of course, uh, again, the question of uh, why um, it is not always manifested in our lives, that's, that's, that's a very good question. You see here, I have some seeds. I have some seeds. I have lavender. I have forget-me-not. So, I have seeds, and these seeds need to be planted, and then they grow, and then you see beautiful flowers. In the same way, when we are born again, when we are spiritually born, we have all the seeds. Now, we need to be intentional We need to, about this. We need to let God to grow, to manifest, you know, this fruit of the Spirit in us. So, how is it possible? We need to understand our design, our structure. When we are born into this world, we are bodies and souls, according to the scriptures, right? So we are bodies animated by soul, which means we have feelings, we have mind, but we are spiritually dead, right? The scripture says that we are spiritually dead. Say, Gospel of John, chapter 
uh, 3, uh, when Jesus talks to Nicodemus, he says, you need to be born of the Spirit. And uh, of the Spirit, uh, you need to be born again. And Nicodemus doesn't understand it. How, how, what does it mean to be born again? Well, Jesus is talking about, you know, being born of the Spirit. When we believe in Jesus, when we are born again, our spirit is alive. Now the Holy Spirit is working through our spirit in our soul and our body, right? So this is how the Holy Spirit is able uh, to, to uh, transform us. This is how the fruit of the Spirit is manifested in us. So the root, the energy, all the juices are coming from the Holy Spirit into our life, into us, and then they manifest themselves as the fruit of the Spirit. This is very beautiful and easy to understand, uh, apart from the fact that our body is tainted by sin. The old Adam or sinful nature in us is still present and will always be present until we die, which means that our sinful nature and our you know, old Adam will be always pushing against the Spirit. That is why we do not always see the manifestation of the Spirit, the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We are not intentional about this. We do not seek it. We can build obstacles, you know, by our choices, uh, not being focused on the Lord, not intentionally seeking these elements of the fruit in our lives, right? So, and letting, frankly speaking, letting the old Adam, letting our sinful nature to reign, uh, to dominate in our lives. So this is what is happening. Sometimes we are able to overcome. Sometimes we let the old Adam, our sinful nature, to dominate. So the good news is that we have everything, everything we need to become conquerors, to become, uh, uh, to be, to, to become victorious, to overcome our sinful nature. We have everything. The Lord has prepared it for us. Now, the question is, how do we acquire it? How do we actually, uh, how, do how do we claim, how do we get it? How do we activate all these things in us? So, if we keep uh, thinking uh, if if we if if we think about all the elements, you know, of the fruit. Uh, last time we spoke about kindness and gentleness, and let me just remind you that it's not just regular kindness, regular gentleness, as we human beings kind of use it in our everyday language. When we look at the fruit of the spirit, it's always supernatural kindness, supernatural gentleness, right? For example, if you think about gentleness, it's not just gentle and weak. On the contrary, it's gentle and strong. And we see that Jesus is described as gentle. And in Matthew 11, he says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, says Jesus, for I am gentle and and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Well, Jesus is talking about this strong gentleness, because you cannot call Jesus weak. Jesus is never weak. He is the creator of this universe. He can destroy the entire universe in a second, right? So, but still, he's so strong, at the same time, he is gentle. So, this is kind of gentleness what we need, right? So, we need to be gentle, and then also kind, but when the goodness, in Titus chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, the Apostle Paul says, when the goodness and loving kindness, and in English it's two words, loving kindness, but in the Greek language it's just one, it's kindness, but it's a very special divine kindness. When the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared, He saved us, not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. Here we see that God is good because of his goodness and his kindness. He saves us, right? So again, kindness, it's not just, hey, I let you do whatever you want. Kindness is also concerned about truth and about salvation. But you can see that here we have a pair of words. We have goodness and loving kindness. And today we are talking about the goodness of God. And you see that in this context, the goodness of God 
uh, uh, goodness of God um, is being talked about in the context of appearance. It says that the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared when this appeared. And of course, the Apostle Paul is talking about incarnation of Jesus. He's talking about Jesus, the moment where Jesus got incarnate, you know, and then dies on the cross and then is raised from the dead. This is when the goodness and loving kindness of God, our Savior, appeared. Well, he saved us not because of works done by us in righteousness, but according to his own mercy. And as we uh, look at our today's text, we see that the Apostle Paul says that the fruit of the Spirit, the supernatural fruit of the supernatural Spirit is this goodness, this supernatural goodness. And we can see goodness of God and, of course, theologically speaking, we say that God is good. This is part of his character. He never changes. He, it's, you know, God's goodness. It's moral excellence. Uh, but we can see God's goodness in two things. We can see God's goodness in creation and in redemption. Let us look a little bit at creation. We go to first three chapters of Genesis. Genesis 1, God creates everything and say, take one, uh, Genesis 1, uh, verse 31. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And this is what is happening. You see the first two chapters and this is good, this is good, this is good. Well, the creation is good. There is no death. There is no sin. There is no violence. There is no darkness. It's good. But what happens in chapter 3? In chapter 3, we see that man and woman uh, who were supposed to be obedient to the Lord, they were given freedom. And they misuse their freedom, and then what happens? We know the fall, right? So Satan is able to deceive them, and uh, Adam and Eve, because of their disobedience, they actually taste the fruit of the tree that gives them knowledge of good and evil. Death enters the world. And it's not just that Adam and Eve are now corrupted, their nature is corrupted, which they, by the way, pass on to all of us. So that is why I'm wearing glasses, right? Because my nature is corrupted. And that is why my back hurts. <laughs> and that is why I will die at some point if Jesus doesn't come first. So that is because my nature is corrupted. And if you look under, you know, if you look under an electronic microscope, you will see that as people grow uh, in years, cells, they uh, accumulate uh, a lot of, uh, you know, proteins that are created by mistakes, you know, that are not useful. And then at some point, the number of mistakes made by our cells is no longer compatible with life. This is because of Adam and Eve. And it's not just us human beings, it's the whole creation. We see that animals die, plants die, you know, the whole creation is, is corrupted. So, but God, he, you see, he didn't create evil. He didn't create all this mass. So all he created was good. But because Adam and Eve uh, disobeyed the Lord, you know, because of the fall, we see that the whole creation is tainted by sin. But God did not stop there. He still is good. And he showed his goodness in uh, preparing redemption for us. And you can see in the Old Testament many, many times something like this, like in Psalm 118, verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, for his mercy endures forever. And this uh, shows us the character of God. He is good, he is morally good, he doesn't wish evil to anyone, and his mercy endures forever, which means that the moment, the moment uh, humankind is doomed, in the person of Adam and Eve, he already prepared salvation for us, redemption for us, of course. You know, it's Jesus. His mercy endures forever. Now, I'm googling uh, all kind of uh, phrases 
just to see what this popular culture thinks about different ideas and concepts. And I googled good, you know, and people say, well, we are good people, you are good people, good things happen to good people, uh, good people make good places, you know. I hear that all the time. But uh, is it biblical? I understand that you can see this good things happen to good people. What does it mean, good people? Well, when you look at us people biblically, you see that nobody's good. You know, Romans 3.12, the Apostle Paul repeats what Psalms say, what Psalms say about us. All have turned aside, together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. And you may say, even me? Yes, even you, and even me. No, I mean, we all are not good in the eyes of the Lord. Because even small sin makes us transgressors, right? We transgress God's law. And what is punishment for that? Death, right? No one is good. And then if you lead a little bit closer, you see that in the Gospels, say in the Gospel of Mark, when this rich young ruler approaches Jesus and says, well, good teacher. And then Jesus says, why do you call me good? And then Jesus makes a very important theological point. No one is good except God alone. Wow. But I thought we are good people. Well, biblically speaking, we are not. We are not good people. Only God is good. Only God is without any flaw, moral excellence. You know, there is no darkness in him. If we try to dissect it in smaller pieces, how can we understand that, that he is good for his mercy endures forever? Well, God has no evil in him. There is no evil in him. And God didn't create evil. Evil is absence of good, right? No evil, no darkness. God is light. There is no darkness. There is no injustice. He's not unpleasant, you know. There is no cruelty in God. He's good. And we, we are not good because I'm good as long as I'm not hungry. But when I'm hungry, I'm not <laughs> so good, right? Or if I'm tired. Or if I have plans and something interferes with my plans. And then you can stupid this, stupid that, right? All of a sudden I'm angry and I'm no longer kind and nice and good. And, uh, you know, this is who we are as people. How we treat one another. We are not good. So that is why when we are born again, now we have this opportunity to be the temple of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit can manifest himself in us, and he can manifest his kindness, his gentleness, his joy, the supernatural joy, supernatural peace, and supernatural goodness. Be like God which is impossible for us, but because he is in us and because he is working on us, we can be like him. We can manifest a little bit of his goodness. Um, and this can flow through us towards other people, right? So God is good and we want this quality. So you see, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. And in the Greek language, the word is agato sine. And agat, so it's good. It's uh, agatos, it's good. But agato sine, sine is ending, which shows that it's noun, it's goodness. It's nas in English and sine in the Greek language. This word, you cannot find this word in secular manuscripts in the Greek language. You can find it only in the New Testament. You can find it only in the, in the scriptures. It's a very biblical word. It's very scriptural word. It's, you know, certain quality that um, secular writers who were writing, you know, in the times of the New Testament, they were not thinking about this at all. And then Paul says, no, 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 you need to have this quality. And this is given to you as a gift by the Holy Spirit. Now walk 
in step with the Spirit, so this fruit may be seen, may be visible, may manifest itself in your lives. Okay? Good. Good God. Again, let us go over this. It means merciful. His mercy endures forever. He's forgiving. He wishing us the best. He's loving. He will never betray us. He will never leave us alone. He will never do anything evil or mean to us. Um, people can do all those things. People are willing to lie and be mean. Politicians are willing to be uh, to, to, to deceive. Um, companies are willing to deceive, to increase sales. You know, you, you see that in human nature all the time. But God is not like that. He will never, he will never use you. He will never abuse you. Because he is good. This is part of his character. It's, it's not like he is good today and tomorrow he may not be good. He's always good. He never changes. He also is holy and he also is just. And this is where we people, we cannot kind of agree with that. We think if God is good, that means that he affirms everything we want. He gives us everything we want. Uh, he never tells us, uh, that we are wrong. No, no, no. Specifically, because he is good, he is also holy and just. Okay, he is holy, he doesn't tolerate any sin, and he is just. And because he is holy and just, we can see his goodness in his plan of salvation, which means that he planned for Jesus to be incarnate, to be Jesus down on the cross, and for Jesus to be raised from the dead. This is called God's plan of salvation. This is exactly what Jesus did for us. And that is why we can say he's good. Now, you may think about, okay, so, but I think that life is good when I'm, you know, was saved miraculously from death or was healed or, you know, uh, something bad was going to happen to me and it didn't happen. But you know what? Um even if bad things are happening in this corrupted world, God is still good. Uh, in Psalm 73, uh, we see, you know, the psalmist says, I watch around and I see all these wicked people. They are rich and they are getting even richer and they have like position of power. And I thought to myself, the psalmist says, I wanted to keep my heart pure, but I'm not as rich as they are. I'm actually not rich at all. And then he says, well, I went to the temple of the Lord and then I saw our lives in the light of eternity and I saw that the end of this wicked people is destruction. But the end of those who love God, it's eternal life. And you see, what Jesus has done for us is not uh, completed yet because what he did, he offered us justification, sanctification, forgiveness of, of sins. But when I say it's not completed yet, it's what the Apostle Paul describes very well in Romans chapter 8. He says, we, he says, we Christians are now spiritually alive. We are spiritually alive. We are forgiven. We are justified. We are sanctified. We are saved, but we still live in our bodies. And he says, well, we will still suffer with our bodies. We can get sick. They can persecute us. They can kill. All the apostles were abused and all of them were executed except for John. And, you know, early Christians, Stephen, first martyr. I mean, they didn't live like good life, right? So they, 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 they struggled. They were hungry and naked. And still, they believed that the Lord is good because they were able to see that he offers us this eternal life. As far as the body, the apostle says, and the whole creation, he says, we are in the pangs of birth uh, process. 
he says, we are waiting when our bodies will be redeemed, when the whole creation will be liberated from the bondage of corruption, which means that all this creation, including ourselves, it's still in the process. We don't know when. Is it the second coming of Christ, when he comes, when all these things will be liberated from corruption, you know, all the animals that die every year and trees and people and everything. So, but bodies and creation will be liberated from corruption as well. And Paul says, this is what we're waiting for. And then he says, neither death, nor hunger, or nakedness, or anything, or persecution can separate us from the love of God from the love of Christ. Nothing can separate us. And then in the same chapter, he says something like this, for I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us, both spiritually and physically. Because God promises us not just spiritual eternal salvation, but also physical resurrection of our bodies right? So this is what he promises us, and new earth. So this is what is his promise. So what does it mean? It means, yes, God is super good. Even today, he gives us food and money and shelter and friends. He provides for us. But even if in this corrupted world we experience terrible things still, we know that God is still good, right? Now, the fruit of the Spirit is goodness. I invite you to meditate over the goodness of God and how this goodness can be visible in us. And if there is anything that is an obstacle or hindrance for the Spirit in us, you know, to flow through us, may that hindrance or obstacle be removed. I invite you to pray. Dear Jesus, we read in the scriptures about the fruit of the Spirit. Joy, peace, love, gentleness, kindness, goodness. Jesus, we know that this is a gift from you to us. And if there is anything that is an obstacle in us for the fruit of the Spirit to manifest itself. Please remove that obstacle. Remove those obstacles. Please forgive us. Cleanse us. Help us be intentional about seeking all these elements of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. We cannot do anything ourselves. We want your Holy Spirit to flow through us, to work in us, and to flourish in us. May your will be done, Jesus, in us. In your name we pray. Amen.